All right, we are opening the doors and letting people come on in and join us here today. I wanted to say a quick good afternoon and welcome to today's ATI member exclusive education facilitated by GovMates. We're going to dive into all the good stuff about AI and legal considerations in just a moment, but wanted to give some quick introductions as we get started. I am your event host, Meg O'Hara, and I'm GovMates Director of Engagement, and I'll be monitoring the Q&A and facilitating the discussion for questions and, and things like that. But the, the brain power behind the entire discussion will be introduced here in just a second. For those of you who might not know GovMates, we are a technology scouting platform connecting small and non-traditional businesses with system integrators and agencies who are seeking innovative solutions to their federal challenges. We provide matchmaking, education, resource resources and more for ATI and our ecosystem. So as we get started here, I would like to provide you with a few participation reminders if this is the first time that you are joining us. First is first, remove those distractions. If you haven't had lunch yet, now's a great time to like eat lunch and listen. It's a, you know, a lunch and learn maybe for you. So if you want to, you know, Good. Try and keep this to about an hour. So silence your cell phone, close down those tabs on your device and try and stay out of your email. This is the best excuse that you could have for the day to do that. We also encourage you to be active in the chat. You should see a chat box and a Q&A down at the bottom right of your screen. So if you have something general that you just want to say like a quick hello or like, hey, I can't see the slides or something like that, use the chat box for that one. If you have a specific question, make sure that you put that one in the Q&A so our panelists can see that and give you know due attention to those as they come up. We will be taking those audience questions. So make sure that you put them in either as they come up or toward the end where we will have time for that as well. If something is relevant to the group at large, we'll be sure to touch on it. If something is a little bit more nuanced and it involves a little bit longer of a discussion, we'll make sure that we connect you with today's presenters in order to have that conversation at a later time for a more in-depth discussion. And then finally, we are recording. It should have told you when you popped on that there is a recording happening today. Once that is processed and posted, should you like a copy and you haven't found it in your inbox, we do plan to email that afterwards. So you'll get a copy of the slides as well as the recording, but we'll make sure to send that to you. If you don't get it, just reach out to ati at govmates.com and we will get that over to you. So here is where I get to take a breath and introduce today's panelists. We have Brian Detweiler and Eric Blatt from Scale LLP, but I'm going to give them the opportunity to chat a little about who they are and what they do. So Brian, I'm going to turn over to you first. Who are you and what do you do with Scale? Thank you, Meg. Um, yep, I'm Brian Detweiler. I am a government contracts and IP attorney. My educational background is in computer science, so I at least understand a little bit about AI with my technical background. Um, before becoming a lawyer, I worked as a patent examiner for a couple of years at the USPTO, um, then worked in-house for about 15 years as an IP manager, um, also as general counsel for a number of tech startups. Um, I helped them sort of think about and solve some of the challenges that we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, a little over a year ago, I joined Scale LLP. Um, this is uh, Scale LLP is a full service, fully distributed national law firm, um, and a, uh, a small part of that firm um, is uh, part is represented by by me and Eric, um, and we offer um, a lot of advice and counsel to tech startups, um, especially those that are working with the government um, and have IP and uh, and related issues. Eric. Um, nice to meet everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Eric Blatt, I'm a partner at Scale LP, uh, along with Brian, work very closely with him. Uh, I am also an IP and government contracts attorney, also started my career at the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, was a patent examiner for six years, uh, joined an IP boutique in Washington, D.C., did high-stakes patent infringement litigation, and then I wound up getting pulled into the defense technology world um, and wound up developing a very robust expertise around sort of technology startup meets the DOD. Um, so we try to provide a sort of a one-stop solution for companies that have that mix of needs. We do um, commercial IP issues, patent portfolio development, software licensing, and then on the, the DOD and a bunch of other sort of startup corporate issues, financing, et cetera. Um, then on the DOD side, we do the, the prime contract reviews, uh, data rights assertions, um, licensing technology, the federal government on commercial terms. Um, we do defense industry transactions, subcontracts from, from large primes, and also subcontracting to, to other companies. Uh, again, we export controls, ITAR, um, try to be a one-stop shop for, for that mix of companies. We represent about 150 dual-use tech startups. 
And Brian, back to you. Perfect. Thank you again, both for being here. And now I'm actually going to turn it completely over to the two gentlemen here for today's presentation. Don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A so we don't miss them. And gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Meg. Um, so this is just a really high level of the sort of things that we're going to talk about today. Really quick introduction into what the government's interest is in AI. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about licensing to the government. Also, uh, while thinking about sort of commercial applications too, right? We're going to try to, you know, there's a balancing act there and working with um, both the government and commercial customers. Then we're going to try to give a little bit of a practical example um, that we put together called a DIU case study. Um, and then finally leave some time open for questions and answers. So Meg, move on to the next slide, please. So what is the government's interest in AI? Well, the, the, the next few slides admittedly are a little bit of fluff um, and we'll, we'll kind of speed through them, but I want to set the stage for the rest of the conversation. Um, and as you may have guessed, this picture was not generated by a human, right? Tried to stay on, on brand here, had a little fun with Dolly uh, in, in putting this together. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so we know the government is interested in AI, but did you know that there was a particular executive order on the topic? Um, I won't say that it's a very interesting read, but, but there is an accompanying fact sheet that spells out some of the areas of interest, um, which may spark some ideas uh, for develop, development or research if you were so inclined. For example, um, one of the things mentioned is protecting Americans from AI-enabled fraud and deception, developing AI tools for to fixing vulnerabilities uh, in critical software, preserving uh, privacy-preserving pre techniques in AI training algorithms, and, and also addressing algorithmic discrimination. These are all things that the that this executive order identified as potential target areas of interest um, for the government. Next slide, please. So what is the government going to do about it? Well, it has said that it wants to expand grants for AI research, especially in areas like vital areas like healthcare and climate change. It also wants to help businesses, small businesses commercialize AI breakthroughs. And this is perhaps uh, the uh, most ambitious of all. It wants to uh, help agencies improve through rapid and uh, more rapid and efficient contracting. Uh, so these are all good news for us. Eric, what are some ways that the government can help us achieve these objectives, like helping small businesses commercialize their AI breakthroughs? Um, well, there are a number of things that uh, the government does. Obviously, um, providing funding to companies is, is a key um, element there. So the SBI or STTR programs are a key way to get funding to small businesses and startups to fund the development of technology. There's other contract vehicles within the DOD, um, AFIT, uh, Rider, uh, a bunch of other DIU obviously is, is a big um, and increasingly important um, funding vehicle, development vehicle for um, technology. Um, we have Kratos mentioned here, which can be a really nice vehicle to sort of get your technology in front of the government, um, get some feedback, some evaluation, they potentially help you. Um, you know, both evaluate the technology, provide some credibility. Sometimes it can be also be a way to, to get a clearance. Um, so uh, some significant opportunities in, in creators as well, although the government cannot pay you under those vehicles. So um, the, the, the paid vehicles are always preferred by, by the clients. Next slide. So you've decided that you want both the government and commercial customers, right? You kind of want to dabble in both worlds. Maybe it's because you found a good RFP for some AI tech that's not so different from something that your company is already working on. So you see this opportunity for short-term and maybe even long-term revenue um, from Uncle Sam. So what are some of the things that you should be thinking about? That's what we're gonna talk about next. One of the first areas um, that we like to think about is IP, right? So in addition to doing government contracting, Eric and I are both IP lawyers and to an IP, IP lawyer, everything looks like IP. Um, but one of the key pieces of the wisdom that we wanna to share, to share with you today is to think about IP early. Um, 
have a good understanding of what your intellectual property is, what rights you have and or want, uh, and what do you need to do to protect that IP before you start contracting with the government. So to that first point of understanding what your IP is, especially when we're thinking about uh, the world of AI, what exactly is it that's, that's new and special about what you've developed? Is it just sort of icing on the cake? Um, by that, I just mean like, is it um, you've taken something that was traditionally done perhaps more uh, rigidly or routinely and you've just, you're using AI to improve it? Are you harnessing AI in some completely new way? Think about, are you using standard models, right? That are produced either, you know, open source or by some third party, or are you actually creating new ones? And where does your, where does your training data come from? Um, there's becoming a, a big marketplace for AI training data. Perhaps the, the value that you bring is in the training data itself or how the, the training actually occurs. Um, we know that uh, from that executive order, for example, uh, they identified privacy preserving techniques in training, right? Perhaps that is something um, that is worth protecting. Uh, and so once you've identified your IP, you have to know the rules of the game that you're playing. Next slide, please. So unfortunately, there's not just one set of rules, right? We have two different sets of rules, depending on whether we're talking about the commercial or the government markets. In the commercial game, one of your best, but not only forms of protection is going to be patents, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute. In the government game, it's all about the tangled web of government data rights. Ideally, if you're playing both games well, you can capture kind of that sweet spot that's the intersection of these two circles in the slide here. Next slide, please. So let's talk about protecting your IP in the commercial market first, right? Now, please remember that this is just a very high level overview of IP protection. Um, and, and so for brevity, we may even be a bit imprecise with certain language. But the point is to get you thinking about these things and asking the right questions early on, uh, which is, again, one of our key nuggets of, of wisdom for the day. First, we have trade secrets. And this form of protection only works if you can actually keep something a secret. AI algorithms, to the extent that they're not patentable and they're embodied in source code, are often best protected by trade secret. Trade secret protection requires that you have solid data security practices. You want to have good HR policies, right? Because you don't want your employees, you know, running off with code and and sharing it or being uh, you know, lazy about leaving it on on computers that uh, that anyone can access. You also want to have good N NDA protections with your partners and suppliers and other third parties that you're working with. And the reason why this trade secret protection can be valuable is that the law specifically provides ways for you to recover damages in the event that someone does in fact misappropriate your trade secrets. But that law only works to your benefit if in fact you've actually done the things that we just talked about, um, protecting your, your, actually keeping it a secret. What about copyright? Well, copyright law protects things from being outright copied, right? This is your code, your programs, your files, but it doesn't actually protect the underlying ideas, which can often be expressed in, in an infinite number of ways, right? You can write the same program uh, to do the same thing in many different ways. Copyright law only protects the copying of the literal code, not the actual underlying ideas. And to the extent that you've compiled data from different sources, for example, the data you've collected for AI training purposes, there's going to be very limited protection from copyright law there because you didn't actually author the data yourself. It's just you've collected things together and that data set gets very, very limited protection from copyright law. Next slide, please. So I, first of all, I love this image. Um, I, I believe I asked Dolly to give me a graphic representation of patenting AI technologies. Uh, and what I got was an Android who appears to re be reviewing some ancient patent documents. Uh, you mean, you mean a patoid? <laughs> <laughs> and it's using a magnifying glass for some reason. I guess it, it doesn't have a, a good uh, vision technology. Um, but anyway, <laughs> patents are useful at protecting the new and non-obvious underlying ideas for your technology, right? This is, this is what was missing from, from, from trade secret and, and copyright protection. 
Um, as you probably know, patents prevent others from making, using, or selling your invention in the territory in which you got the patent. So a US patent, for example, pre prevents a competitor from developing and or selling your AI tech in the US, but it doesn't prevent them from doing the same overseas. You would actually have to get patents in the uh, jurisdictions, other jurisdictions in which you might want to uh, stop competitors from, from operating. Uh, a lot of software engineers in particular are skeptical about patents uh, because they, they don't think that they can get patents for their AI algorithms. Um, because they tend, they, they think of them as just a rehashing of old ideas. The truth is that your competitors are getting patents in this area. We see them, you know, every day, um, and those patents have have real value. Um, Eric, do you want to talk a minute about some of the ways that patents are valuable uh, in the commercial? Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. Um, so patents are an interesting item in the government contracting world. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the reason that most of our clients wind up pursuing patents uh, is basically strictly for um, pleasing investors and increasing the valuation of the company um, in the event of, uh, you know, sale of the company. Um, that tends to get uh, be what actually motivates people to invest the, the time and, and the, the resources that are required to, to obtain the patents. Um, I will say, though, that patents actually come up a pretty pretty often in terms of sort of business strategy discussions. We often, I often get calls with companies who say, hey, um, you know, I am interested, you know, I have this capability, may I, maybe I have this contract, a couple contracts, I'm interested in this other opportunity, but I'm really worried that the government is going to award this contract to one of my competitors, or maybe I've got a sole source authority and I'm worried about this, you know, the government taking my information and recompeting the contract or something to that effect. Sometimes they, they have a specific competitor in mind, sometimes they don't. Um, and it often comes down to have we, has the company filed? So a lot of times what, what the companies are, are specifically thinking about is super phase three authority comes up a lot. Um, hey, I'm supposed to have sole source for this technology. Um, can I prevent the government from competing this openly? Um, turns out the Cyber Sole Source Authority mandate, it's not always the strongest basis. Uh, people have litigated that issue many times. You tend to lose on that. Um, then we talk about what al alternatives there are. So we have the data that's controlled under government data rights. The government can't use that data potentially um, to recompete, but there's always the worry that you know, maybe the company, the competitor doesn't need your data to recompete because they have their own solution. And then you're looking at patents. Patents wind up being the the, the basis to sort of build that competitive moat. Um, and a lot of times the government, you know, in the commercial world, if you have a patent on a technology, getting Apple not to not, you know, not to infringe that patent and not to compete against you. Good luck. It's hard to do, but the government actually does care a decent amount about patents. The government sort of feels like it's issuing the patents and it ought, ought to respect them. Um, so I, I think patents actually really do have a, a, a meaningful and important place in terms of building your moat in the federal marketplace. But also applicable in the commercial marketplace. And yes, it oh, is absolutely. Yeah. You know, it can be difficult to enforce against the really big players, but we know that they're valuable in valuation. We know that when you are working with um, your, your counterparts to, you know, on, on solutions together, it can help you negotiate better terms for you. Um, investors... You know, when, when they go to your your data room, they like seeing that there's patents and patent strategy and IP strategy built out there that helps them uh, have some further confidence in in what you're developing here, right? So again, as we're trying to find that sweet spot, yeah, I'm uh, financing a patent litigation. It's unattractive to a startup or small business, kind of until it isn't. Um, so if you have a patent on a technology and others, you know, you, you get the patent pretty early in the process. Um, and then you kind of develop your technology, you try to build out a business around it for a couple of years. Um, a lot of times, you know, maybe there's no infringement or the infringement is is light enough in terms of the, the sales revenue that it's not really worth investing in, in the resources into an infringement claim. But if, if there's a lot of dollars flowing through infringing technology and you've got big tech companies using your, your capability, um, all of a sudden it really does make sense to, to file these lawsuits. And a lot of times you can get investors to, to bear that risk um, and so it's it sort of it, the, the patent infringement lawsuits are sort of unattractive until 
the the damages pool and the infringement is large enough and then they become profitable yeah um well that's part of the venn diagram uh we're going to talk about now sort of government data rights part the other set of rules next slide eric do you want to take this one yeah so what are government data rights um when you submit a proposal for a federal contract, you have to fill out your data rights assertion. Sometimes the contracting officer will ask you to update it before you you um, the contract is signed. Um, people are familiar with seeing these these data rights assertions. A lot of people don't fully understand exactly what government data rights are. Uh, the simple definition is government data rights are a license that you grant to the government, um, and it tells the government what it can and cannot do with technology that you deliver. Um, importantly, it covers data. Uh, a lot of commercial first companies think of data as maybe something you scrape off the internet or something that goes in a spreadsheet, sometimes, or something that comes off a sensor. Um, sometimes that data people think of important. Sometimes people think, yeah, data maybe not that important. Turns out um, that's the wrong interpretation that the government defines data extremely broadly and data is really, really important. Um, so data, the government defines it as recorded information, regardless of the format in which it's recorded. So your software is data, your reports are data, your technical diagrams are data, architecture, your reports, every, you know, the product specifications for, for your product, all that is data. And if you give it to the government, um, that's going to be what's governed by those government data rights. So if you care about, for example, whether your software can go out the door to your competitors, you need to care about government data rights. Um, <clears throat> data rights, you can sort of, there's a bunch of clauses. These are standard boilerplate terms in the federal acquisition regulation, the FAR and the DFARs. Um, but the bottom line is some of the, the data rights categories are proprietary. Um, they sort of operate like a non-disclosure agreement with the government where the government is going to be restricted in what it can do. And then there's other categories that are non-proprietary and you basically give the government a license to do whatever it wants with, with that technology. Next slide. Um, so the civilian agencies and the DOD use meaningfully uh, different data rights clauses. Uh, most of our clients are working with the DOD. Uh, if anyone has questions about the civilian agency clauses, I'm always happy to chat, but we're gonna mostly focus on the, the DOD issues today. Um, DOD data rights clauses focus on the source of funding. Um, generally, if you develop something so exclusively at private expense, that thing will remain proprietary even if you deliver it to the government. Um, and you, you'll put one of the proprietary rights categories on it and the government will generally respect that. Um, however, if government funding is used even in a small part, the government is usually gonna receive a very broad license. Uh, there's a key exception for super contracts where even though the government's funding it, it's treated as though it's privately funded for a period of 20 years. So, so it's very helpful. Um, but if you are sort of mixing private funding, super funding and um, sort of general uh, government contract dollars together, uh, you probably want to make a plan in terms of which pieces are going to be funded using which source of funding so that you can keep a part of your technology, usually sort of your core IP proprietary and happy to talk about the details there. Next slide. Um, so the non-proprietary categories, just to, to tick through some of these, you guys will probably recognize these government purpose rights. That's what it sounds like. The government can use that item of technology um, any way it wants, so long as it has a governmental purpose to do so. Government generally has a governmental purpose to do everything that it does, and so that basically means the government can do what it wants with, with that item of data. Unlimited rights, it means that the government can do whatever it wants with that item of data, even if it doesn't have a governmental purpose. Um, I kind of think it's government purpose rights and unlimited rights is functionally the same thing. Um, uh, in the proprietary category, so in the DoD, these are going to be the things that you either develop exclusively at private expense, or developed under a cyber contract. Um, so we, we separate technical data from software. So software is the easy one. It's software, and that can be your source code, compiled code, um, whatever it is, that, that's software. And then things that are not software, but are still technical. Um, so your product specifications, the reports you deliver to the government, things that are in a spreadsheet, training data, all that's technical data. Um, and if that's developed ex at private expense, then it's limited rights, and, and we'll talk about the details there. If it's software, it's restricted rights if it's developed at private expense. Um, and then cyber data rights is, it can either be technical data or software, but then for a period of 20 years, it's treated as, as developed at private expense, so you get effectively limited rights or restricted rights. Next slide. Um, so the... Uh, 
the when you're thinking about taking a federal contract, um, you have some trade-offs. Um, you will be receiving uh, funding, so you get non-dilutive investment. You can build out your product. You can make some profit there. Um, but there are meaningful IP um, risks. Um, you, you, you will grant some sort of license in whatever it is that you deliver. Um, so the way that you manage that is you figure out what rights categories are going to apply and, and you, um, you, you're you just careful about that strategy. You can also be careful about what you deliver to the government. Um, a lot of folks will sort of craft their statements of work, their, their, um, their work plans in a way that uh, maybe they're developed delivering only reports rather than delivering the, the code itself or the training data. Um, just kind of think about what makes sense, what your customer is going to expect, and sort of what you can, um, how, how you can manage sort of over delivering, uh, avoid over delivering. Um, and then that's that's the, the data rights component. The patents also work under their own set of rules. Um, so if, uh, then you're looking at um, the Bayh-Dole Act, which is this concept that if you um, have an invention that is developed, generated under a federal contract, and the government is effectively going to receive a royalty-free license to that patent. Um, the patent becomes unenforceable against the government. Um, so there's a couple ways for an invention to become a subject invention, an invention that was, was federally funded. <clears throat> the first possibility is if you conceive of the invention in the performance of work under federal funding agreement, so the idea pops into your head while you're working under a contract, um, that's a subject invention. The government's going to receive a royalty-free uh, license. Second possibility is, and this this comes up actually uh, more, much more often for our clients, which is um, you come up with the invention prior to contract award. Um, generally, that's what the proposal is about. You have the invention in your head. You write your proposal. Hey, we want to validate this, build it out, whatever you want to do. Um, and then you use that federal contract, that funding, to build the first working prototype. You you, you make the first actual reduction to practice of, of the invention or federal contract. That also creates a subject invention. The government receives royalty for uh, license to, to that invention. Um, Oftentimes, the best way to avoid that first actual reduction to practice um, under a government funding agreement, you can build sort of a rudimentary prototype, just sort of proof of concept that it works prior to contract award. That's your first actual reduction to practice. You file the patent application, um, and then maybe you do some further development and testing under contract, but you, you've sort of avoided falling into that subject invention category, which is a, a better thing to do. If you can't avoid it, you should avoid it for the most part. Next slide. I think you so covered here's, here's, Yeah, here's here's the, the list of things that happens if it's a subject invention, comes out enforceable against the government. Um, not only can the government use the invention itself, we can also hire contractors to use it on behalf. Merchant rights, I usually skip over these. They sound scary, but in 42, 43 years of the Bayh-Dole Act, it's never happened. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, it might happen in the future. I guess you should know it's out there, but um, it, it generally doesn't happen. Uh, you're supposed to make, if you have a subject invention, patent on subject invention, you're supposed to make it in the US. There's accelerated filing deadlines, there's reporting requirements. Um, all this is, none of it's terrible, um, but it is a little bit of a hassle. So our general position is if you can do your inventing at private expense, that's a better way to do things. Next slide. Yeah, and so that that's kind of what we're we're sort of bringing to to a loop here, right? Is that if if you want to kind of get the best of both worlds, conceive you know conceive the invention outside of contract, reduce it to practice, get that get that prototype going, file your patent applications early, as Eric mentioned, right? Let's get them on on board, and then think about the work that you're doing for the government as customizations, right? This is taking your 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 invention, your product, your commercial product, um, and you're developing small pieces of small branches, you know, specifically for the government customer. And then really what you're only giving up, you know, rights to is that that limited customization, which shouldn't impact um, your your other commercial opportunities. Um, and then we're going to talk about how you can actually achieve licensing your your technology to the government on commercial terms. Next slide. So commercial license agreements, um, the, the FAR actually provides a preference right, for the government to leverage commercial solutions where available. That means like the, the, the government recognizes right, that, that there are at least good opportunities to take really good products that already exist 
and simply uh, not create them from scratch, right? And so there are mechanisms for do that to, for doing that, and it permits companies um, to to license under their their standard commercial terms. And not only permits, but actually uh, it, you're supposed to, right? <laughs> you're supposed to use the company's uh, standard commercial terms. Um, but there are some often some limited adjustments that need to be made to uh, a company's traditional, let's say your your end user license agreement that that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, there are some small tweaks that usually have to be made. Um, the government can't accept some of those terms, things like uh, you know having a particular state's law govern the contract. Well, the you know, government doesn't like that. It's it's going to follow federal law um, and some other things too. But for the most part, you can get the the meat of those those commercial license agreements, right? That you're talking about, you know, the type of license, how it's enforced, um, things like that, the term of the license, all that stuff is negotiable and and can be a part of these um, these discussions with the government. Next slide. So, having introduced all of these these ideas and talked about this this sort of dual use world, um, we wanted to talk about an actual sort of, well, an, an example scenario of, of building something for the uh, defense uh, innovation, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, defense, in <clears throat> the defense innovation, one second. You're good, that one trips me up too. That's why we have acronyms in the government. <laughs> That's why we all use acronyms because everything has multiple syllables. Apologies. I'm talking so much. Uh, the Vents Innovation Unit. So this is based on work that we've done for a couple of our clients that we've sort of merged together and simplified a little bit for this presentation. So in this example, the DIU wants a new AI enhanced technology. And the development will occur under an other transaction agreement, right, or an OTA. And for those of you who aren't familiar, OTAs are procurement methods for working uh, with non-traditional contractors, right? not the big primes, to develop cool new stuff that, uh, with less red tape. There's more flexibility in how the deals are structured um, and are great for getting work done fast, right? at least by sort of government standards. In this example, the client already has an existing commercial product, and that product is built on a third-party AI framework. But it requires customization to meet DIU specific objectives. And lastly, the AI model in this, in this example is gonna be trained on government data. So how are we gonna think about that? Next slide, please. So as we sort of started off earlier in the presentation, we wanted to identify what is the IP? What, what, are we, what do we need to protect here, right? So I like to think about it in these four different categories. We have the commercial product, right? This is this is the client's uh, the client's thing, right? Obviously, wants to keep all of these rights, right? We keep this proprietary. Don't want to give anything unne unnecessary to the government. We have the third party uh, AI framework, right? This is the part that maybe it was open source, maybe it's through some other commercial license. The client didn't develop it, right? We're using it from from somebody else. We can't give <laughs> give the, those rights to the government. Besides just the right to use, right? The same rights that we have under our own license. So we need to keep that in a separate bucket. We have government customizations, right? This is what we're actually going to be building under contract. These are the things that the government wants and is likely going to get um, their data rights to so that they can use it to the maximum extent permitted. And then lastly, you know, in this example, there's gotta be also be some government training data. <clears throat> um, the government wants and we'll, we'll, you know, what well, the government will retain these rights to the government training data. And likely that's fine because we're probably, I shouldn't say probably, but, but we're, there's a good chance that we won't need need that information, that the government training data isn't going to help help the client very much in that case. So once you've sort of separated, segregated, identified these different, uh, different areas, um, that can help us find, again, find that sweet spot in, in, the, uh, in the Venn diagram. Next slide, please. So let's set the stage for how we're going to uh, approach the government as we try to get under contract. So in this example, the client has already conceived the invention and reduced it to practice, right? A plus. They've filed uh, patent applications for sort of the key pieces of technology. 
They've actually offered the technology for sale, or at least they are making key steps along the way uh, to, to, sell the, to sell that technology to commercial customers under a commercial software license agreement. The reason that's necessary is that when you're going, in order for you to make the case to the government customer that they should license your technology under commercial terms, you actually have to have a commercial product, right? Um, and so this is really important that you uh, you document and that you think about actually, you know, crafting a commercial license agreement about, you know, marketing your product in a way that makes sense for you. Client has also reviewed its third party license rights to the AI framework, making sure that that what they want to do for the government is actually permitted under their under the license rights granted for that framework or maybe it's you know any other part of of the software or the solution that is not home built right that might also include open source software or other things um, that you want to make sure that you are free and clear to to do what it is you want to do with the government to uh, you know under this contract next slide Really quickly while we're scooching to that next slide, um, this is a good place for, especially in like the reviewed, the third party license, right? This is a great place to kind of bring you guys in, correct? Because I know that from a layman's perspective, reading something like the third party license rights is kind of all jargon to me. <laughs> so is that a good place where we could kind of bring in you guys or, or have a conversation there and say, hey, can you review this and make sure that what we're offering is something we can offer? Yeah, so so reviewing commercial contracts is absolutely part of you know part of what we do. So we can do that. And you're right, like it, it's great to really understand what rights you have, what you can do, what's permitted. Um, it may require you to even go back to the licensor from whom you're getting that just to sort of clarify or request some additional rights to do what you want to do. Um, but we can absolutely uh, assist with that, and it it's a good thing to get right. And, and to piggyback on that a little bit, you don't necessarily have to hire Brian and myself, but I would say if, if you're going to take an OT um, that relates to technology that you care about and would like to remain proprietary, there's just a lot of moving parts of those agreements. And they, I mean, unlike a FAR contract where everything is sort of boilerplate and negotiation is sort of what clauses go into the contract and maybe some data rights assertions, there's actually a lot of variance in terms of what the OTs say. Um, and there's a meaningful amount of strategy in terms of you know whether your position is a commercial product, what your license agreement says, how you scope it. Um, there's there's a decent amount of nuance there. So I would I think it's definitely worth engaging legal counsel if you're going to negotiate an OT. Perfect. I like to think that I'm smart on things like that, but I also know my limitations. So it's always nice to have somebody smarter in the room. <laughs> And that actually brings us to you know the next slide where we talk about some of the things that that are actually negotiable with the government and and things that you should look for um, when you're you know negotiating that OT with the government. And these are just a few examples, right? This is not an exhaustive list, um, but just some things again that have come up in our practice regularly um, and often. These you know so, so the. The, the contracting officer you know, that you're dealing with, right? They're they're starting with templates um, that often are not, you know, configured or customized for a particular customer, um, and so we want to look out for certain gotchas. Um, first one that comes up is, you know, what happens if there's a stop work, work order or the government wants to terminate your contract, right? They decide at some point, eh, let's change our mind here, which they have the right to do. Um, we just want to make sure that that our clients get paid, right? That, that get paid a fair and reasonable amount based on the work that has already been done, based on any commitments of financial or other resources. Um, we wanna make sure that that is covered in this, in this agreement. There's transfer restrictions, right? So um, working with DIU, for example, they want to, they want to put uh, as tight a net often on, on what you can do with the work that you're building, building here. And, Certainly, you know, they have the right to control stuff that you're building for them for which they're going to have rights. But we want to make sure that they don't cast that net too wide that might capture your commercial product and prevent you from, you know, transferring that, whether that's a part of an acquisition, whether that's, you know, you have uh, have work that you're doing in other countries. Um, you want to make sure that there are no limitations that can negatively impact what you do on the commercial side of things. And, and one more that's not here. Um... I always encourage clients to try to avoid 
agreeing to an uncapped indemnification obligation, um, particularly for, for IP infringement. So there's a it's a low risk, but it's a non-zero risk that the someone sees, you know, you 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 won this contract, it's a competitor, and they, you know, they they think whatever you're doing infringes their patent um, or or some other IP that they hold. They sue the government for IP misappropriation, patent infringement. At, if you've agreed to an uncapped in, indemnification, the government will always be able to defend itself. It'll have the Department of Justice to defend it. You will not control the outcome of that settlement. You will not control the DOJ's tremendous inefficiencies. And then the DOJ could potentially send you a bill for its legal fees and however much it settled the case for. And you know when you're talking about an organization as long as large as the federal government, as inefficient as the federal government, that could potentially put a small business out of, out of business. So um, a lot of times we, we do see the government come in and ask for uncapped indemnification, and, and that's one that I think is is potentially quite problematic. Yep. Uh, next one I had on here was the commercial license. Oh, I can go back. <laughs> yeah, just finishing up the last couple here. So com there's commercial license terms, right? This is what. This is taking your existing commercial license agreement um, and then making some modifications, changes that are going to you know, meet the, uh, the government's objectives, things that we just talked about. Where, so even though the government expects us to indemnify them if they're sued, the government will not, for example, indemnify us, right? And so there's some things that we have to uh, have to work with there. Um, dispute resolution. Sometimes the default clauses for dis dispute resolution are very unfavorable. Um, there's sometimes a little bit of wiggle room there to, to make sure that we at least get a fair shake if there's a, a dispute. Proprietary information, right? So uh, we're going to be sharing, our clients going to be sharing proprietary information with the government under this. Um, we want to know what would happen if there is a FOIA request for information where that might potentially turn over some of our information, right? So we can put in some protections to help at least make sure that um, any information to the extent it absolutely must be shared is under confidentiality terms like an NDA. Uh, and then there's the data rights assertions part, right? This is this is one of the most complex parts of the negotiation. Um, oftentimes, at least I've found that the person on the other end on the government side doesn't fully comprehend how it all works. Um, and so there's sometimes a little education that has to happen. Sometimes you have to bend a little bit to maybe do things maybe, I don't wanna say the wrong way, but just sort of uh, slightly inefficiently just to satisfy what um, the, the government customer thinks needs to be done. Um, but if there was ever a time to to sort of, you know, get some illegal assistance uh, or counsel here, um, it is certainly with data rights assertions, which is what we're gonna talk about on the next slide, please. So this is uh, just sort of an example table. If you've never seen a table like this, uh, it's gonna look maybe a little foreign, but it's not super complicated to understand what we're doing, right? So the very leftmost column is where we're going to list the different things that are part of our deliverables for which we are going to, uh, we want to assert anything less than unlimited rights, right? So if you don't put it in here, the government's gonna assume that it has unlimited rights to what you deliver. Now, um, so, so the first, first column is where you're listing the different things, right? So in this case, we have sort of different categories. We have sort of a commercial product. Um, we have uh, maybe the third parties, you know, AI framework that we were using under a license. And then maybe we also have uh, something that was, that we previously developed under a government contract, but not, uh, with uh, uh, unlimited rights, right? This could be a cyber contract for which there are actually cyber data rights applies. So we want to make sure that we would call that out here as well. Um, the basis for assertion, right? That's where we give, we explain why we think we should be in, in that particular category, or why that thing that uh, in, in column one should not actually get unlimited rights. Um, if it was developed exclusively under private expense, right? That is a really good justification and one of the permitted justifications for allowing us to uh, claim restricted rights uh, or limited rights. Uh, and then the, uh, the third category is where you specify the particular rights. And um, this is what Eric talked about a little bit ago with the different categories. 
Uh, and then finally is just sort of the name of the entity making that assertion. So if it's your stuff, um, it's you, right? It's you, your company. Um, if in the case where it's a third party's, you know, uh, information, then that party's name gets listed there. And this seems simple enough when you look at it this way, but there is actually, there, there, there are a lot of nuances and uh, complexities that happen. Um, for example, even just sort of separating a, uh, for example, a software product that into different categories like this, when it may not have been engineered in a way that sort of permits that separation, um, but there could have been parts that were developed under a prior government contract, um, those are integrated, maybe it, it just starts to get a little bit dicey. Uh, and that brings us back to another reason, again, why we want to start thinking about these things early, because we can talk to the engineers, we can help them think about in the architecting of their solution, ways that make sense so that this sort of division uh, is easier to do, right? So that we don't risk blending uh, things that the government might have more rights to with the stuff that we want uh, to to maintain commercial, right? Um, again, more more planning, uh, you know, it, it pays off in the end. I think that's kind of it for for me. I want to say about this slide. Uh, next slide, please. These are sort of you know walk away take home tips um, based on what we've talked about so far, right? And, just kind of touched on, right? We want to file our patent applications, develop our prototypes, think about data rights, do all of that stuff early. Uh, we want to establish our standard operating procedures, you know, about our government facing IP. This is understanding the different data rights terms as they're going to be applicable to funding opportunities. We want to scope our proposed deliverables and do that in a way that best protects our proprietary rights. We want to make those data rights assertions correctly, right? Um, something that's hard to scrape back if you do it incorrectly. And the last one, which I have with an exclamation point here, because it is extremely, extremely important, and we haven't really touched on it yet, um, is make sure to mark your deliverables accordingly. If you don't mark something as you know being under a particular category or having certain proprietary rights. Uh, it will be treated like something that has unlimited rights, right? Then, and, and that is that is obviously going to be very bad. So the the contract itself is typically going to specify legends, things that you should append to all of your documents, all your deliverables. Um, it is extremely important that you follow those rules, that you establish policies and procedures to make sure that your engineers are doing it, that someone is double checking it before it goes out to make sure everything's properly marked. Um, if there's only one thing you take away from this presentation, that is that's probably the one thing to to remember. Last slide. Open it up for Q and A. Exactly, opening up for questions. So I'm going to ask this question, knowing full well that the answer is probably no, but my my heart, heart of hope wants there to be an answer that's yes. Um, is there any like retroactive, hey, I made that, I should have patented it, but now I want to sort of thing? Or it's like once it's made and if you don't do it at that point, you're you're stuck. So we do have, um, so, so the, the patent statute does specify certain deadlines, right? There's also, we call them patent bars that prevent you from getting patents for certain things that either you've publicly disclosed more than a year ago um, or, or offered for sale uh, more than a year ago. So there is sort of like, you kind of have a little bit of a one year grace period, um, but ultimately, uh, right, we, we, you know, if, if you're falling into the, it, it's still a race to the patent office, right? And right. so to the extent that you are falling behind there, you're potentially gonna fall behind, you know, uh, uh, in getting patents for in competitive areas. Okay. Um, so there's there's some wiggle room. Okay, a little bit, but not enough to make me comfortable. <laughs> yeah. <I had> to... <laughs> and then on top of that, we kind of talked early on about some of the trade secrets, right? Um, is there a world or does it happen where trade secrets sometimes get out and then we have to quickly patent them? Does that happen? And is it something we need to worry about? A weird so, question. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, so, I mean, 
that's that's an interesting question. I, I think that can certainly can happen, right? Is to to think about it that way. Um, typically, our analysis starts by thinking about whether something is best protected as one or the other, um, because oftentimes the things that fall in the trade secret bucket are things that can be difficult to patent. Right. Um, you know, maybe these are if you think about the classic formula for Coca-Cola sort of thing, right? It's not necessarily a patentable thing, but we wanna we wanna keep that in the trade secret bucket. If anything can be patented, you know, certainly it's our our recommendation to try to patent that if it if it's valuable enough to you. Um in the event that there was sort of a a breach or whatnot, um yeah, I mean we would certainly that would be one of the questions we would ask is all right, well now it's out there in the world. There's no way to sort of pull it back in. Um, is there is there an opportunity to patent it? Yeah, we could certainly have that conversation. We just hope that that's never an option. <laughs> we hope that's not a conversation that we're having. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I want to say a very big thank you to both Brian and Eric and you know the Scale LLP team, as well as everybody in the audience who joined us today. And if you're watching us on the replay, um, you can connect with all of us on LinkedIn, both of the gentlemen's um, information is right there as well if you want to reach out uh, after the event. As a note, we are quickly approaching, as of today, we are quickly approaching AUSA matchmaking, which is on October 15th in the DC area. So if anybody's headed to AUSA and wants to join us for matchmaking as part of the event, uh, all you have to do is reach out to me and let me know and we'll get you set up for that. If you have additional questions post-webinar that uh, didn't get answered or something you think about as you're kind of watching a replay, all you have to do is let me know and I will be sure to connect you with both Eric and Brian or at least point you in the right direction to get the answer uh, that you need from those guys. But we hope that you all have a fantastic rest of the week and we look forward to seeing you either online again or in person very soon. Brian, Eric, anything else you wanted to add as a, as final notes before we release everyone for the rest of their day? I think that's it for me. Eric? Pleasure to be here. Thank, thanks everyone. Awesome. Thank you both. And uh, we'll see everybody very soon. Bye-bye.